Riverside, California. On the night of October 30th, 1966, a good-looking young woman left this college library and started home. She never made it. Her brutally stabbed body was found the next day by a campus groundskeeper. Sometime afterward, a young man sat quietly in this same library. No one noticed as he carefully scratched something into a study desktop, a poem, its subject, Violent Death. Its final line, just wait until next time. Next time came on December 20th, 1968. A teenage couple stop in a secluded lover's lane in the Northern California community of Vallejo. Both end up victims of a killer with a nine millimeter handgun. On July 5th, 1969, another couple is attacked in Vallejo's Blue Rock Spring Park. This time, the young man survives, but the identity of the killer remains a mystery. That changes on August 2nd. A strange letter arrives at the offices of three Northern California newspapers. The writer takes credit for the recent murders and threatens more. As a clue to his identity, he encloses a page covered with these eerie symbols, a cryptogram, his signature, this sinister crosshair sign. Top code breakers and even a Navy computer struggle to decipher the message, but a Salinas, California school teacher is the one who finally cracks the code. Written without a break between words, the message is terrifying. I like killing people because it's so much fun. When I die, I'll be reborn in paradise, and all that I've killed will become my slaves. On September 27th, the code killer strikes again, this time with a 12-inch knife. The victims are a third couple. Miraculously, the young man survives. He relives the horror of his experience for police and the media. But he can offer little to identify his attacker. I have no the killer wore a hood when he struck. I'm hard against him. I just don't want this to happen again to anyone else. It does happen again. October 12th, 1969. Near this San Francisco street corner about 9.30 p.m. The victim, a part-time cab driver. This time there are witnesses. They see a young white male, about 170 pounds, with a blonde crew cut and glasses, run into a nearby playground. October 13th, the police finally have the beginnings of a face to work with. But the killer is far from frightened. In another letter, he tells the world his name. This is Zodiac speaking. I am the murderer of the taxi driver over on Washington Street in Maple last night. A blood-stained scrap of the murdered cab driver's shirt sent with the letter clinches the identification. Two days later, there is near panic in San Francisco. Zodiac threatens to attack a bus of school children. School children make nice targets. I'll just pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing off the bus. Police set up special protective measures, even though they know they're up against heavy odds. But Zodiac is only toying with them. He never acts on his threat. Headquarters, San Francisco Police Department. A key figure in the Zodiac investigation is Detective Dave Toshi. Toshi isn't shy about publicity, but he's also a seasoned cop who's determined to get his man. Toshi seems tantalizingly close on October 22nd. Someone claiming to be Zodiac calls a San Francisco talk show and arranges a meeting with lawyer Melvin Belli. I got a way of telling whether the this is a man who calls himself Zodiac, but I know it's a man when he tells you about Belli keeps the appointment, but the caller never shows. Then, on December 28th, Belli receives a scrap of the cab driver's shirt and a frightening Christmas greeting. This is Zodiac speaking. I wish you a happy Christmas. The one thing I ask of you is this. Please help me. I cannot reach out for help because of this thing in me won't let me. For Dave Toshi and the San Francisco police, 1970 is a year of frustration. The letters and the cards continue. Zodiac brags that he has killed nine, then 10, 12, 13. The police have little new to go on except this more detailed composite picture. During 1971, Zodiac ups his count to 17. Some unsolved murders have possible Zodiac links. But in this fascinating case, even an accurate death count is impossible. 1973, for almost two years, Zodiac has been ominously silent. Then, January 31st, the silence is shattered. I saw and think The Exorcist was the biggest satirical comedy I've ever seen. 
The unsigned note ends with a mysterious quotation from a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta hinting at suicide and a final threat. If I don't see this note in your paper, I'll do something nasty. For the next four years, San Franciscans anxiously await Zodiac's next move. Occasional anonymous letters are linked to the mysterious killer. But by 1978, police wonder if the man called Zodiac has finally decided to join his victims in his fantasy afterlife. Then, April 25th, 1978. This is the Zodiac speaking. I am back with you. Tell Herb Kane that I am here. I was always here. That city peak Tashi is good, but I'm smarter and better. Once again, Dave Toshi and the killer he's tracked for nine frustrating years are headline news. But then, the case takes an unexpected turn. A magazine writer reveals that he received anonymous letters praising Toshi's work. The letters were all traced to Toshi himself. Then when experts doubt the authenticity of the latest Zodiac message, rumors spread that it too is an example of Dave Toshi's anonymous letter writing. A desperate attempt to keep his most famous case alive. Was it? Tashi openly admits writing the letters about his work, but denies he wrote the latest Zodiac note. And there's no proof that he did. The Tashi scandal, the latest and most amazing addition to a frustrating string of false leads. To this day, the Zodiac mystery remains in the unsolved file of the San Francisco police. Where is Zodiac? Dead, in prison for some lesser offense, or safe in a mental institution? Has he lost his lust to kill and return to a life of non-violent obscurity? Or is he walking these streets, biding his time, waiting to strike again?